You mentioned that you hadn't explored ETH music NFTs to the degree that you have here, but why would one choose to build their music profile through audio nodes forces going to a mature market on Ethereum? What would you say are the main differences between them and what do you believe makes Bitcoin superior? It's just always about the strength of the chain. I was never anti-Ethereum or anything like this. I just felt like at some point when the excitement and the tribalism wears off and it's a simple question asked to a big business, do you want to secure your assets? assets in the 99.8% secure place or do you want to store it in the 99.9% .9 secure place it becomes a no-brainer eventually for me that was it I couldn't quantify exactly what the difference was but there's definitely an advantage to the fact that Bitcoin is proof of work and is mined the way it is and has the system that's set up it just says to me that this blockchain is going to be all other blockchains in terms of its existence its lifetime NFTs on Bitcoin, something that we have not talked about on this show, something I actually do not know much about. So I brought on to the show today, Jim.BTC, who I happened to talk with in a recent Twitter spaces. He's the creator of Audio Knowles, which is one of the new music Bitcoin standards that uses recursion, from my understanding. And he was also one of the creators of This Is Number One, which was a Stax NFT or music NFT platform. So Jim's been on building on Bitcoin for quite some time. And I'm excited to, to learn more about your journey, music NFTs on the mother chain of Bitcoin, and kind of how recursion is completely changing and where this space is going, as we were kind of discussing right before we started recording. So really appreciate you for coming on. No worries. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. I've not had many, as I said, I've not had many music NFT individuals on here. So I'm assuming it because I'm assuming that you have probably quite a dense history in the music NFT industry as either on the management side or maybe as the artist. A little bit about your background bef before entering the crypto space and the, the music NFT world. Well, I mean, it goes back quite a, quite a long way. My introduction to bitcoin was back in 2011 i was back, back then i was a kind of music producer and a sound engineer and i was a tour manager and i was actually introduced to bitcoin by someone on the the back of a tour bus saying showing off about some weed they'd bought online and i i, heard, I overheard this conversation and thought oh, oh my god how how's that happening how do you buy something on the internet with your credit card or whatever so I had a conversation with the guy and of course what was just the thing that was really piquing my interest was like you know what is this what is this thing that's allowing people to transact like this so i went and read the the bitcoin white paper and i was just kind of hooked started to try and learn coding around that time but then ended up actually remortgaging my house and uh, importing the uk's first two-way uh, bitcoin atm machine in 2014 that was kind of my way of going okay i'm just going to dive headlong in here i'm not a techie in that sense but i'm just going to learn because I, I instantly at that point <clears throat> was aware of things like Western Union and MoneyGram. And so I think I did a demo in 2015, which I would love to find the videos for where I set up with another ATM owner in Australia to show people how Bitcoin could be used to send, you know, value instant, instantly. And I got the guy to put $20 in the machine in Oz and I took out £10 from the machine here. The internet crashed in the middle of it, so it took 10 minutes instead of one minute, which was, which was pretty annoying and left me sweating. But that's where the sort of the journey began. Uh, as a musician and a producer, always been on my mind how out of their depth these performing rights societies are. So uh, from the very early days when I was still touring, you know, up until sort of 2015, 2016, I was, you know, trying to tell all these people I was working with on tours, you know, what will be possible with, with Bitcoin and with smart contracts. I had been lucky enough in 2015 to meet this guy, Mike Cohen, who's one of the core developers on Stacks in 2015 through the ATM. And he sowed the seed in my mind saying, this thing, Ethereum's going to come along. You're going to love it. It's going to do all this really crazy stuff. But just know that we will do this on Bitcoin. We just haven't figured it out yet. But but this is the way, you know. So I was always, it was always in the back of my mind that, yeah, okay, this is this is not it's not that ethereum does this and bitcoin does this it's just that ethereum is showing us how to do this but if we can do it on bitcoin then we want to do it on bitcoin and so that sort of meant i always had 
my eye on Bitcoin, never really got into the Ethereum thing. I did a few little forays into just trying to mint things, but then heard about block stacking around 2017 again through Mike Cohen, started this doing this app mining thing with, with block stack and was on the fringes of it, just interested in, you know, whatever was going to happen on Bitcoin. And then 2021, when they launched the main net, that was when it was like, okay, I think the main net was going live and there was no talk of NFTs at that point in the sort of in the in among the sort of the stacks, the very early stacks people. There was there was this guy called Boom Boom Wallet, Dan Trevino. He he was very ahead of his time as well. But you know, he'd just kind of come up with a contract, put it out there and said, anyone can use this contract to make NFTs and hadn't made a lot of noise. So with our music background, you know, my thought was let's try and get some big names in here. So uh, between myself and my partner, Dash, we managed to uh, get uh, this artist, Chemical X, in who we'd been working with for a few years. And then through him, he had a friend, he was friends with Fatboy Slim, Cara Delevingne, Dave, uh, Dave Stewart from Eurythmics. And then my good friend, uh, Phil Hartnell's one half of Orbital. And they're a UK dance act. So we sort of got all of them in really just to make some noise. Did these five very exclusive, they're the first NFTs like sort of made on stacks that are, you know, they're audio visual, they're beautiful. I mean, one of them is like 400 megabytes, but they're, they're one of one. So, so we, we, we launched those. We sold the Cara one at the time for quite a lot of money. When you think about what Stacks was, you know, Stacks was completely unknown. I think it was about twenty twenty eight thousand dollars or something it sold for. But at that point, I realized, you know, this is very exclusive. What we've done here, we need to start giving stuff out. And then this is number one really then became about giving stuff away, community, you know. So we then ended up talking Fatboy Slim and Chemical X into giving us a thousand. These are the first, this is the first music collection ever on stacks you know secured by bitcoin it wasn't on chain at this point but it was as close as we could get and we couldn't even give them away a thousand uh, literally a, a made four stacks an exclusive track written by fatboy slim who's done no other nfts ever and so we got these these thousand and i think we managed to give away about 700 or 600 of them and then over the next few months we just give them out here and there and then that sort of set the set the trend and so we then all the artists that we would bring on with this is number one, we'd be like, you know, here's your collection, but think about something that you can do to sort of give away, you know, Dashiell's just a bit of a, a master of uh, building out these networks and finding utility in, uh, you know, we've got a loyalty loyalty system on this is number one, which not, I don't know if any other NFT marketplaces have that where you can earn loyalty points and then they are automated system, which which you can then use those loyalty points to get discounts on, on future mints and things like that. So we're always big on innovation, but so that's, you know, my mind is always looking for what's possible. And I guess that's what's led uh, eventually to all audionals is that we were looking when we first started with number one as to how to create a royalty mechanism that would work for music. It's great for art when you've got artists who are, you know, independent. They don't necessarily have the, the complex relationships that musicians have. And and then again, you know, there's also, there's also a collaborative, a lot of bands. So you've got several musicians, deals with record labels and management and publishers. And, you know, it's it's extraordinarily complicated. It's dynamic. It's not like these things are set in stone either. So you know, we were looking for that. We we gave ourselves a very hard time at the start because we were determined to do everything on chain. We made a rod for our back. It was very difficult. We ended up having several f sort of public face plants before we decided to partner with Gamma to so they could sort of do the tech stuff, and then mm -hmm. we could just worry about dealing with artists and all that stuff. So, Jim, here yeah. let me let me ask you this. Let me pause you. It's it, when you look through like the history of tokenized music on the blockchain it's gone through a variety of mechanisms and i think it's still to this day kind of largely undefined what the actual kind of breakthrough utility is for it so when you go to like the earliest types of quote-unquote music nfts you see simple things as just like tokenized lyrics on on namecoin and then when you go to counterparty and uh, which is on bitcoin you see like i had tatiana on the show who tried tokenizing her her music album in 2014 you had Skrilla who had tokenized like lyrics and and some types of like primitive uh, audio files, and then then you start moving over to Ethereum, and the, people start experimenting with like generative audio sample files, and then you led to it leads all the way up to kind of this like peak moment where Justin Blau sold that music file. I think it was for like six million dollars or something like this, and then he ended up creating Royal. If you're familiar with Royal, he's also trying to do on-chain royalties on Ethereum, and I think now it's moved to, to Polygon. And he talks a lot about how trying to even break through the art or the, the music industry 
is like trying to drill through like a mountain because of just how gated it really is, right? And how much how much political power these music agencies really have. And now we kind of see different things that music are used for, for, for everything from like collectibles to token gating, different types of music access. From your point of view, what, what do you think is like the biggest or, or, or what is the, we'll say the best use case for music and blockchain used together? Well, honestly, until I had this sort of moment of inspiration with Audionals, which really came through at making a, this this sequencer, which just worked better than I thought it would. Until that had happened, I would have said it's it's possibly just token gating. It's not much more exciting than that, other than the ledger. The ledger side of things is very, very exciting because there are ways to track everything. But in terms of like minting your music and putting it, firstly, it's IPFS. Secondly, it's public. Unless you're going to encrypt something, which is just, you know, what's, you know, why, why would you do that? If again, if it's IPFS or I can actually see the, the use case in doing it on Bitcoin, it's still, yeah, I mean, it has complications, but it's just in terms of like the financial model for most musicians, you know, you don't, you don't give your stuff away. So it's, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's been, it's been evading me the whole time. You know, what is it apart from merging you know, music with this new world and saying, okay, I'm going to give the music away for free, but then I'm going to generate these collectibles, which are part of me. And I'm going to get into the loyalty stuff. You know, there's lots of, lots of interesting mechanics, but the real utility, or in fact, the real financial model is certainly in, in the terms that musicians might understand, but it's not there. And that was when, when I first made the sequencer. So the idea sprang from how could I put some, some samples online that would have uh, enough metadata that I could, you know, usefully do something in, in a sequence. I've been playing around with code since GPT-4 came along. I've always understood the mechanics of code, but I've been illiterate until GPT-4 came along and I could sort of turn my, my thoughts into code. And suddenly it's, it's kind of like a superpower. It's just allowed me to do all these crazy things. I started by building synths. So, you know, I have this amazing MS-10, you know, old Korg synth here, which are, you know I've used in, in many bands. And I started trying to emulate sounds from that, just sounds, you know, like I don't have to emulate the whole thing. But if I give it a range of settings, like of envelope settings and 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 a and a, a wave type and a, a cutoff and, and an octave, and I do all of this in a piece of code, I can generate that sound as a kind of one-off. And that file, once it's compressed, is like two kilobytes or three kilobytes. It's very small. It's a couple of dollars to inscribe. And so now you've got this synth. Yeah, it's a kind of one-trick pony, but it's got all the notes and it does this one particular sound and it's cost one or two dollars to get there. But now that's that's a modular piece of my my future studio kit. It will never move. It will never become redundant. It's it's written. It's just it works that way. It works the way it is. So what if whatever I write on it, I'm guaranteed in the future that whoever I reference this music to and it can link to that thing, i.e., the song and the unit are both inscriptions. It can never go wrong. It will always do what it did the day that I made it. I know that that's the sort of beauty of Bitcoin. And so what I've done here with this sequencer is I created just five. I think I've only made four audionals so far. And, I, you know, I, the audio is I was probably getting to this is that it's all about this metadata. So the audio, rather than being an MP3 or flat, which you can have limited metadata fields, plus you have to have a kind of player in between them by doing what I've done, which is break the audio down into base 64. It's like a binary. It's sort of moving towards computer speak rather than away from it. But so break it down into binary, put it inside a JSON file, which can then have as many fields as I want. I think I've got about 30 fields. So it's, it's designed to be museum level, you know, preservation, curation, but on the, on the upper level, you know, what instrument is it? What sub instrument is it? What's the key? What's the tone? You know, standardizing all these fields so that it can be indexed. Because ultimately, what I want on this player is when you click on, you know, a channel and you're like, this is a drum channel work, and it should just drop it down a menu and go, well, here's all the available drums. Again, there's only five samples available right now. Although there are, I have got some closed testing going on. So some people are, I think, making some inscriptions now, a handful of people. So it's not getting rinsed in any way, but it's like I've just got these kind of fairly inferior samples on here but if you play this sequencer you know people can see how this is this is the future of sort of music online and it's progress programmatically assembling because what i can do is i can then inscribe this sequence uh, and in fact i've now got an upgrade on this one which gives now 64 sequences in a row so you can now create 64 sequences 
So that's like 256 bars or something of, in fact, I think it's 1,024 bars of music. All we need is this library to have more samples in it. At the moment, if people did start making it, it's all going to sound very samey using the one kick and the one bass, which incidentally has a kick in it. I was in a hurry, I was testing, so I ended up making a bass that's actually got a kick in it. But once you've, I was just playing tonight with this synth, you know, that, that it's two kilobytes. And once that's there, I can have a little MIDI line on here as well that's now playing. It's light MIDI, but it's now it's actual synthesizer that's, that's there inscribed on the chain. It's mind-blowing how many possibilities there are here. I was trying to design this without getting too hooked into it myself because I need to concentrate on the library, but to inspire people to go, hey, look at what this guy did. He's not, he's not a developer. He's not a coder. He's done this completely on his own. I know what I'm doing. You know, that's what we want is some people who've actually built digital emulators and built plugins for, for Pro Tools and Logic. We want them to see this stuff and go, I see what this is about. So this is where the idea initially comes from, which is break it down into drum loops, drum samples and hits. And now we can start to look at this in a whole different way, which is the samples become the really valuable thing. The samples become the thing that are, are owned and sought after. And anything that you build and inscribe is just is using that perfect ledger, literally your song, which is just this list of instructions, including the links to every sample you've used and how many times you used the sample in that song. I mean, talk about micropayments. It's like, how many times was that kick used? Not like they used your kick. It's like, we know how many times they used your kick because it's written in the instructions that your kick was accessed this many times in this inscription. So there's no denial of any potential royalties. Enforcement is another thing. So I've written fields into these the Audion or JSON standard that people can enter their license, their intended license, you know, information so that if it is commercially used, whoever is paying out those things has a very simple method of saying, okay, who who is owed what? And some of that will come down to looking at the correct fields. I, I was talking to someone today about getting these fields lined up so they actually could effectively be be into you know communicating with all the different royalty standards around the world so that anyone can look at a file and somewhere in that file is a field that can be read by a specific you know organization or whatever in order to get the information they need and whether they you know, they're reading okay this one's license free we don't have to pay anything to this musician because they have specifically stated that it's a free license versus this musician who has said you know they're, they're kick drum they expect to get paid for so all right yeah. jim well while you were talking i i made a little bit of a sequence and see how this goes just so they could hear i can't actually hear that it's coming through mine i think okay so I might have to fix that, but but you can save that and load. You can save that with that, that little save button down the left uh, at the bottom on the left is if you save that, that will download your settings here, your mute settings, and all of your trigger settings and the samples that you're using in the left. It will download them all as a JSON file. It's just a very simple text file, and then if you were to click load and then load up your different JSON file. So this is a, I've, I've put that in as a soft way for people to go away and come back without having to lose everything they've they've created and then when they eventually are really happy with it they can then inscribe it and uh, make it kind of permanent so for those that are just listening and aren't viewing this if i were to describe this of how you've built it it would be the equivalent of going into something like pro tools which djs and music producers use to create music and so you could go into this which is just the simple and beginning version of it and once you're done you can inscribe the audio null composition directly into Bitcoin using recursive inscriptions. Is that correct? Pretty much in a nutshell, yeah. Yeah, we got we you got to break break it down simple for uh, smooth brains yeah, like yeah, me yeah. who have no idea. But can you dive in a little bit to uh, the recursion and how you how you leverage that and how that was the, the big aha moment? Because for those that don't know, the one block limit is four megabytes. And I don't know if you've ever downloaded an audio file, but every time I download a podcast episode of an hour, it's over one gigabyte. So, you know, some of these like very dense music files can be, you know, a few hundred megabytes at some point. But recursion, now you can have all of these ordinals referencing one another to make the audio files to essentially however large you want it to be, barring you have the the Bitcoin to inscribe that. But just tell us a little bit on the technical side of how uh, recursion works within this whole audio null system. 
So, I mean, my my journey with the Curator started with a, 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 a collection that I did that was the first generative collection on Stacks, very simplistic collection called Hash Ones, four colored blocks that, that change in different locations. You can kind of see them there, that one with the number one on it just down there. They're, they're the Hash Ones, the mm. four colored blocks with the one in front of it. So they were the first generative collection on Stacks. There was supposed to be 111 of them. It was so early in the network, the network crashed for about a week and we upgraded our contract in the middle of it and the... the the collection only got to 91. <clears throat> so you go cut to two years later, and it was actually the first thing that I put on ordinals. I, a lot of people were doing repetition, doing things that were already done. I I was uneasy about ordinals at the very beginning, being a long-time Bitcoiner. I was just concerned to start with. I'm, I'm past that now, and I see the advantage, especially with what I'm doing, you know, to save memory and everything. But so I put those, the last 20 hash ones as, as ordinals, and then I had an idea about turning those into from JPEGs into color arrays because they're so simplistic, you know, these four colors and then the number one logo in front of it. I thought maybe I can actually turn these into arrays of color using pixel arrays and GPT. And I then I then converted, you know, one of them into a sub one kilobyte file, which I was like, oh, my God, you know, this is insane. And so then I had the idea about could I take the arrays of colors and and change them all and then and then how much how could i get it so that it would make every single possible variation 4802 and i got that down to a seven kilobyte file so this is around the six millions or something in in ordinals time so i i thought okay again recursion wasn't there but i knew it was coming so i'm like okay i'm going to inscribe this file and then at some point in the future i'm going to come back and grab stuff and i did end up i was going to make it static or, or that you had to click it, then I gave it a very slow rotation. So I think it rotates every 10 seconds, but if you click it, it stops. But so now I've then cut, cut forward to once recursion, came, I think the night that I saw that they posted on the, the GitHub that they, were, that they were allowing people to access, you know, these recursive files through the URL, I did a test with the hash one and got it out. And it's like a 300 or 400 byte file to like reproduce this. So that started the whole recursive thing. Then through talking with Brian at Ordinal's Bot, who I have lots of good chats with over the years, you know, we've known each other for a couple of years, and he's another person who has an imagination, a little, little like mine, you know, he, he just he goes out there, has crazy ideas, and, and doesn't doesn't just put them to the back of his mind, he goes and tries to make them. And so we've had lots of good chats, and he was telling me about, you know, this thing he's working on, which is using recursives to, you know, create collections where You've got all your different traits and you've just got to make the trait once. And now you're just pulling these different traits in. So effectively, all people are, are getting is a little list of instructions of this is your this is the monkey. And this is where all, all the different traits uh, fit on this on this monkey. So that's what he was working on. And of course, the same thing does work for audio. People don't think about it because there hasn't it hasn't really it hasn't really been a, a market for it. But, you know, it works the same way. A song is is exactly the same as a it's not a static image, but it still has these elements that are just called and, and dropped and called and dropped at different times. But the theory of it is exactly the same. It's like what Brian was doing with bringing all these traits together into a picture. You know, a, a song is just doing that in on repeat, different traits every every beat, you know. So it's 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 the, it's exactly the same theory, just from the point of view of a musician. But so the idea is, is, you know, let's create a layer one, which is the tools for making music. And then let's just let the musicians add it through things like like the audio sequencer. And then, you know, I'm just really intrigued to see what this could mean for musicians for ownership of samples but really for the legal side of things because the two pillars of sort of you know the deal in music is there's the there's the the composition and there's the recording and this method means that there's no recording you know that's uh that saying is if a tree falls in the woods there's no one there to hear it does it make a sound this is kind of that in actuality because these songs don't exist when no one's listening they are programmatically assembled when someone takes that list of instructions and says show me what these instructions are doing and they go to the blockchain and they go okay i'm grabbing all these bits from the blockchain in this time and i'm bringing this back to you in real time i've no idea what i'm doing but i'm just firing off a list of instructions you're listening to the song and then you take those instructions away and the song doesn't exist anymore so as soon as we get someone to write a hit on this thing that some label wants to sign, it's just going to be really interesting because they're going to give a lawyer a really hard time because they're going to say, oh, I need the recording. And hopefully someone will insist on saying, no, there's no recording. All you get 
is this JSON file. That's it. It's my sheet music, and that's all I've got for you, and you've got to figure out the legalities of how you're going to do it. And it probably means that you have to pay me first and then ask me to pay you. So if that is the case where, I guess you say, the Genesis file of a music piece is exists in text form as a json how is it interacted with if the if let's say a a tv show wants to to you to leverage that within their their movie or is it something that just is completely crypto native to where the web 2 companies basically miss out and it's primarily going to be used within let's say bitmap the Bitcoin metaverse or or some sort of interactive experience that's crypto native? No, I mean, I totally, this has got to become real world. I, again, this is where some of your other conversations, you know, they're not wrong. The music industry is a beast and it's not going to go down without a fight. I've been through it all for 20 years from, you know, Na LimeWire to Napster to MySpace, all of these revolutions that were, they never had a chance. Even now, I think this is a really great chance, but it is it is a chance. I, th I think it's beyond a chance. I do think this has victory written all over it, but it could take a decade. It could take a generation. I just don't know, but I know that this is moving in the right direction, but they're not going to go down without a fight. We we know that. We know that they're not going to go down without a fight, but this it's for... This gives musicians the chance to take the fight to them because I feel like when it comes to playing something on TV, again, if someone has a big enough hit, if someone writes a big enough hit in this stuff and they hop, they dig in and they say, I'm not making a recording. If you want this on TV, you do what everyone else is doing and you access it through a browser. You know, you access it through a recursive ordinal. I mean, they don't have to, because they're, they're, they're licensed broadcasters or whatever, they they're going to have to come up with new licensing which is like okay how do i buy the recursive ordinal i mean it's only like a dollar or two dollars to make these songs you know as an ordinal so they can they can buy an ordinal but they still have to play it like everyone else does by using that ordinal to trigger the instructions on chain you know the first version of the sequencer that i created is is an inscription the one that, I, that I'm showing people now is is web-based because I can update it. I'm trying to update it every day to, to do things, but there is an early version which is just inscribed, so it's 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 there. You can just load audios in. So this is completely on chain. So that I think that's the kind of idea. If we can, we just have to pull people in there and say, no, you have to operate in this world now. If you want this song, you know, do it this way. I think the be best thing we can do right now is educate and train the future musicians to be more empowered, less uh, likely to just cave in and sign when a glass of champagne is handed, shoved into your hands in a fancy office, you know, don't sign, <laughs> you know, like go through this stuff, go in there and question, 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 because their power is slipping. And the only thing they can do now is be the, 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 the style setters, you know, the fashion, the, the radio pluggers, they, they're the most, most powerful people as, as I see it. The people who are the go-between between between the audience and the producer of music, they are where all the power is now kind of the last bit of power. It's kind of there. And that might never go away because if you do have big TV places that are playing, they're never going to just search day and night for random <laughs> music. They want what's next cool. They want what's cool. And someone is saying what's cool. And there is a machine that is around that. All musicians kind of benefit from that ultimately if they're going through that stuff but you know it's not like we can knock all the walls down that all takes time but yeah i'm assuming jim since you created this you've probably thought through what this could mean you know five ten years from now in this fully you know immersive audio first or audio bitcoin burnt born uh, file but something that's completely native to crypto, at least for the most part, is these on-chain pseudonymous identities, right? Like Satoshi Nakamoto, you have your on-chain footprint, essentially, but no one has any idea who you are. What what does this mean then for the anons that exist on crypto who intru who create you know that first hit song that's born on Bitcoin, but no one has any idea who they are? Do those music agencies come in and just rip it away since the identity is unknown? Or does this mean that there's a new industry that has to be born to kind and of when represent? When you say identity these? is unknown, there's no such thing, is there? Because this is the beauty of this stuff. There's no identity unknown. That's the beauty. We, you, you don't know who they are, but you do know where they are. And you know where that money should go. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's, that's, that's what this has created. It's like, I mean, I did 
what you're saying. I did go 10, 10 years, decades down the line and think, what's this do? And, you know, again, it, it doesn't necessarily take me to the best place. It, it made me think <laughs> that if I'm taking away the recording, the labels, they're going to say, give me back the give me back the recording. And so what they might then do is say, okay, well, when we're now working with these big producers, they say to the producer, show me the samples you want to use and I will inscribe them. So they're in my wallet because that's the only way I can guarantee that I get paid and then I pay you because what this system, like I said, this system sets it up so that ultimately the musician gets paid first, which is kind of like, I mean, wouldn't that be a, a nice thing? Wouldn't that just seem like kind of like normal business musician gets paid first and then the musician pays the people that help the musician but you know that's 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 what's been stolen from like all creatives it's all flipped on its head and be like oh no 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 you, you just be grateful for like the exposure and we'll pay you what you what you get and this flips on its head and says no the musician money goes to the musician that's the beauty of token gating if we did go back to a web two web three token gate your stuff keep it on your server turn spotify into an indexer that that has to request the money from you, an indexer that you use as a service and you as a musician pay them because of the traffic they give you, not the other way around where you're just completely. So that that's like the sort of version I was thinking about a few months ago, but now I'm kind of more in this mode, which is like, you know, let's turn it right on its head because as soon as people are producing those tracks, wherever those samples are, yes, it's pseudonymous. When I inscribe a track and that track says, I've used this kick drum 240 times. I've used this snare drum 240 times. And, and it's this snare drum, which is a link to an actual ID with an actual piece of audio in a metadata form, which then says, this is the creator. There's the licensing rights. You know, all of this stuff is in there. And so there's just no excuse. The excuse will be, A, if you're paying, okay, this person hasn't put rights on there. So probably the person who has set, expressly said rights is going to get more money. But the person who has said that they expect rights is also going to be expected to be used less because they've asked those rights. Or even, even it might be that someone writes a, a hit song, it goes to the label. And because the label can instantaneously take that list of instructions and go, show me the rights for every sample in this. Because that that will just be like, Da, 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 da. it's just communication between with the blockchain so it can just say okay five of these samples don't say anything for, for, about rights six six of them say this but and, but that could be where the label says okay we're rejecting this mix because it's used you know a sample that that we don't want used or whatever and so that that's where they could put their foot down and start insisting on using certain starting with unlicensed obviously they're not going to take stuff that they know is then it's not available to them but then beyond that it could be that they enforce people to use licenses for samples that belong to them because they know that then they will collect the royalties first and then hand it out to people but in terms of the ledger and someone who's been you know pissed off with the whole performing rights set up and these people doing a frankly like like impossible task uh, and pretending like trying to style it out basically styling it out going yeah yeah we're on top of this when it's like it couldn't be further from the truth so suddenly this just makes it all you don't even need those middlemen it's just there the ledger is there for everyone to see and we can all be our own uh you know accountants yeah i think i think you could easily see where this goes because where this conversation is beginning essentially on the ground floor audio nulls is the standard it's essentially the equivalent of a brc20 for, for the fungible token standard right or the GBRC for the generative ERC or BRC 721s on Bitcoin. This is essentially the same thing. It's just now called audio nulls. And this is how we build the standards. But as you mentioned, there's almost two or, or more pieces of this pie. You have the creation of it, this, this provenance and permanence that the, you can prove that you created this sample file, which can then be used by somebody else to give attribution to the artist. But what is the enforcement piece to this? Is do we, will we have to have, will somebody have to create some sort of like enforcement tool that becomes like an audio registry that then therefore pays out the artist of royalties? Have you, have you thought about this at all of what that means? No, or I mean, an open still, as far as enforcement is concerned, I'm still, yeah, the boat, the, the boat is still well and truly out at sea because I mean, this is Bitcoin. There is no enforcement. It's like the only enforcement would be, for example, I mean, thinking about something where there is a security enforcement, which is 
someone someone approached me about a security company they're doing voice recognition and they're talking about how difficult it's been dealing with the security of storing people's voice data even though it's encrypted and stuff but it's still just sort of you know there are, there are concerns related to you know the actual physical storage and stuff and so that that was a bit of an eye opener for them when I explained you know what they could do you know putting it on Bitcoin where it can it can still be encrypted because they have a key for for, for decrypting it. It's still you know it's still there. You don't want to ever lose that key, but it's it's a possibility that they could be storing all of these broken up samples, which their key is the only thing that, that knows to decipher. And maybe there's another key that brings them together so they so they're usable. But then to know that as the user as well, to know that that is where your data is stored it's a it's a it's a kind of win-win not so much not necessarily for the security people i don't know you know the ins and outs of that being like written in stone but for the user certainly for the user to know that you know the source of truth between you is the bitcoin blockchain and not the the provider for these guys servers or whatever that's that's huge and that's another use for this you know i am looking at it as it is like it's like a layer one Going, okay, well, if we take sound, that's why I've sort of come up with this standard with lots and lots of metadata, because I thought it'd be useful for things like even remembering language, you know, like for people to make a make a record of uh, rare languages. I, I think there's probably something for everyone if there was to be, you know, a a consolidated global audio seed bank, if you will, for for, for use for everyone, then then yeah, I think there's plenty of, of use cases and yeah. Yeah, I, I have begun to see more Bitcoin music ordinal based accounts beginning to pop up. And it seems like now there's a handful of ideas surrounding how you do this. Of course, just again, the, the on chain permanence of this makes complete sense. I still c keep going back to throw, as you're speaking, this idea that the music is imprinted as JSON files. And so it's basically born in a different type of medium than what you see as a DJ when Dead Mouse creates a music MP3 file and submits it as the final version. Here, the final version is the JSON file, which just also shows to me it's, you know, it's a higher degree of complex understanding for users, higher degree of permanence, but also another barrier for the, the Web2, I guess you'd say music agency, Goliath, to come in. But if somebody happens to use your sound, you can still socially point to it and say, hey, look, if you compile these together, then this is that sound. And if somebody does happen to, you know, be searching through the Bitcoin blockchain and manages to put your audio files together and rips it off, you know that they've definitely been sleuthing, music sleuthing through the Bitcoin blockchain to capture kind of your work. It, it is quite interesting. But as we kind of look towards, I guess, the future of audio knowles, what what components of the standard are largely uncompleted and what is what is your like your objective as a builder with the standard over the you know next few months i just really want to get the get to use the word standard again sta i want to get it standardized mm -hmm. because that's the main thing about about a stable index so you know putting putting my museum hat on again you know it's it's kind of like we've got to tie that down it's the kind of boring bit i was saying this today i've had you know it's been great i've had a few quite a few people saying you know free offers of help you know people kind of saying this this feels like a really good thing to be a part of so i've uh, firstly had this eom games who actually designed the old gallery and the parrot radio and the parrot gallery on stacks eom jumped in at the last minute when i was struggling with some last minute back end stuff which was just it was just uh, evading me and then since then i've had a couple of other people jump in so i've got some front end people who are trying to help me hopefully will kind of take over the whole sequence of side of things and i'm talking to some indexes about you know getting stuff indexed so that we can uh, be pulling audio files in in a really um, efficient intuitive way in the in the players so yeah there's a few different people kind of jumping on board to help so that's that's a great relief to have that happen because it's a it's a community thing and i can now concentrate on yeah just getting that json standard sorted you now because at the moment if you look uh, on the site and um, people can dm me i am still taking i've only led about i think there's five or ten people who've currently got the address for the sort of inscription side of things which I will open out, but it's also because this JSON standard is still sort of forming, I don't want people to rush in and do loads knowing that the standard is going to change a bit and they won't be as well indexed. The, the, the more I can get that, that JSON form finished, the more likely it, it sort of stays roughly in that format. So it's just, it's mostly there. On the music side, it's there. It's just the forms are currently text 
input and I need, I need to make them drop down menus so you just you select you don't type yourself because this is already the problem we're dealing with with the performing rights societies is that they 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 misspell a song name or put a a space in the wrong place and now the song doesn't exist and either you know they pay you by some miracle they find another song with the same rights or you just don't get paid so you know we've got to, got to make it as 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 uh, idiot proof as possible we'll always have another section that people can fill in themselves if we haven't mentioned the instrument or the genre or whatever but that that's my main thing like probably take me a couple of weeks i just really wanted to get the sequencer to the point where it could do this 256 bars i've now got it it's like 99 percent there there's just one set of sequence lights which shows you the sequence you're in which i haven't managed to get working but i think i'm a day or two away from that and once i've upgraded that it's like okay there's enough there for people to make songs it's like just go out there and make get the samples on there inscribe samples as soon as i open up to people even if people just do sort of one or two of their favorite samples within a few days we'll have thousands of awesome things to play with and the mixes coming out of it will stop sounding like my my initial five samples <laughs> i know at the beginning of this interview you mentioned that you hadn't explored you know eth music nfts to the degree that you have here but at least from your understanding and an opinion why would one choose to to build their music profile through audio nodes versus maybe going to a little bit more of a mature market on Ethereum, what what would you say are like the the main differences between them, and what do you believe in your opinion makes Bitcoin superior or medium? It's just always about just the chain, just the strength of the chain. You know, I I, I have my argument for people for a few years. I was never anti Ethereum or anything like this. I just felt like at some point when the excitement and the tribalism wears off and it's a and it's a simple question asked to a big business do you want to secure your assets in the 99.8 percent secure place or do you want to store it in the 99.9 percent secure place it becomes a no-brainer eventually and for me that was it i didn't i couldn't qualify or quantify exactly what the difference was but there's definitely an advantage to the fact that bitcoin is is proof of work and is mined the way it is and has the the system that's set up it just says to me that this blockchain is going to be all other blockchains in terms of its existence its lifetime and so that that has to be my source of truth that has to be that that's the hardest storage so if i'm going to put anything anywhere i, I guess it needs to be there and again beyond that I would we need more smart contract stuff. This is part of what we've been doing on stacks. If there are smart contracts on Ethereum that are properly paying people, you know, royalties, then you know, stick with that. I don't want musicians to rush over here, you know, in a speculative way when we don't have I don't have the answers for that stuff. Yes, there's something in being in this library and owning these samples because it's it, it's in the ledger that's just no one's ever going to argue with. But in case if there's if there's other you know revolutionary processes out there on other chains that are helping musicians, then you know don't don't ignore that. You know take it when you can get it. If you can even if there's someone who's like you know if you're breaking even, if you're covering your production costs and selling stuff. You know don't rush over here you know st stick with it but uh, but yeah i mean i think for most people in this space don't ignore anything yeah always pursue your curiosity is is one of my suggestions there was a tweet i think it was from cs spears or jb spears and was talking about how there was no or the cool thing with audio knowledge right now is there's no speculatory component to it so it's purely for builders at this moment doesn't mean speculation will never come. Generally, in the space, somebody will figure out a way to how to speculate on it. It's, the DJs it, turn up, don't they? I was in saying some this capacity. Some day, but, but this is about utility. I think this is what is exciting here. Is it's like yes, that that may well it probably will happen in in one way or another. It certainly probably will happen with the early ones. You know, the things that are just made early, they're like that. But again, the real beauty of this is its utility. I had an argument with someone on Twitter the other day who accused me of filling you know, the blockchain with junk. And, you know, it's like, it's like, because again, my, it's on a space is somewhere. I was introduced to Ordinal's inner live spaces. I've been working so hard on my number one project, this project called Narcotics, which we've been working on for months that I just, I hit it passing by. It was like already get, getting 10,000 or something. And my first reaction was shock horror. You know, I was like kind of horrified for, for what it meant for, for the fact that there was now a price on a, on a block. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, so you're telling me that now there's now a price that I can pay to guarantee that no one in the world transacts on Bitcoin for 10 minutes. That was like my first 
thought but after i've gone through all these processes in the game theory and realized you know this is this is kind of what, what bitcoin's meant to do so this guy on, on 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 twitter was saying you're putting junk everywhere blah 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 blah. this is what you're doing and i was like look the ledger has been great the blockchain has been great but if you you know i've now got these songs down to a down to a point where there's like 800 900 bytes it's not much bigger than a, than a regular bitcoin transaction and most bitcoin transactions they're just yes they're secured and they're guaranteed but who's looking Who's ever going to look at that transaction ever again? The yes, they can, and it's there. But ninety-nine percent of transactions, no one. The fact that the security is there is enough for us. We're not going to go back and look. And what I'm doing is putting a the same size file there that is now going to be used again and again and again and again and again by people in all different ways. It's not even just to look at the same thing. It's to take it and change it and then put it back and pull it into something else, take it into a game. I had a chat with a game producer the other day. He was like, how could we interact this with games? I'm like, at the end of the day, if you're getting, if the song is now a JSON, and actually, you know, weirdly, when you put it into the player, my sequencer, it's almost like you're giving someone, like you said, you're giving someone that the song is no longer a mix. It's just the full stems. But if, if a game say a character has a theme tune now instead of having to have okay three maybe five mixes of the theme tune for that character it can now evolve in a way different level where you're like when that character gets this weapon this one instrument changes or these five notes change whatever you know like like totally out of this world don't go there, you know, not scalable kind of ideas, just give the guy three theme tunes throughout the game. You know, that stuff is not, it's not the rule anymore. It's like, just, just use your imagination, imagination because, because this song isn't, isn't a song, it's not a mix, it's a mix, it's a mix, mix you know, there's a deal between, between an artist, artist and a game, and game or whatever, but on, on, at, at, at its, its base, base rule factor, factor, you can take that song as a set of, 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 uh, of instructions and you can algorithmically interact with it. So you can change things, your character can literally be just, be just tweaking, tweaking this song, this song. All, all the way, way through, through as they're there, as they're going the song, the song is changing, changing in, in tiny tiny, tiny ways. ways in yeah, yeah like i said we couldn't possibly dream of this stuff before so very cool well i can't wait to use audio nulls on my bitcoin myspace page when that is created using <laughs> recursion so that everyone can listen to my favorite bitcoin born music while looking through my top eight it's going to be fun yeah. one day. <laughs> yeah. When we're all gray and old and sitting there going, we were there, we were there when the Bitcoin charts first happened. <laughs> Exciting times. Jim, I really appreciate this. It was actually quite insightful. Again, I can't stop thinking about music as JSONs. It's something that I'm going to have to think about for a few days. And hopefully we can come back and have part two once, you, once we finally have this standardized. A beautiful time to you know, be building on Bitcoin and here out on the frontier of the, the music area of Ordinosa. Thank you again for your time. Thanks for having me, Jake. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll catch you next time.